We have in the house Rachel Wilson, who some of you might remember from Breast Cancer Now. Rachel is a nursing specialist. And today we're going to devote, because breast can it's, it's not Breast Cancer Awareness Month, it's um, Women's International Women's Month, but we're focusing on um, cancer, breast cancer, and diagnosis. It might be yourself, it might be a friend. It might be, if it's a friend, not knowing how to navigate being supportive to them and wanting to be your best supportive self. If it's yourself, it's about understanding maybe the emotional stages you go, get through when you get a diagnosis. Rachel, um, also one of your specialities is just, you know, the role of, of sexuality, as a, not the role of sexuality as a woman, but you know, just sexual intimacy um, when you are going through breast cancer. Yeah. Can I just start, Rachel, with if you get a diagnosis, are there stages people go through? You know, are there analysed stages you go through? And do you, would you would like to talk a little bit about that? Because sure. there might be some people watching who've just got a diagnosis or a friend has. Mm. Yeah. So I, at first, it's massive shock. You might not even know that there's anything wrong. Yeah. You might have gone for a screening mammogram. Yeah. And um, as far as you're concerned, everything's fine. And then suddenly you're told you, you've got breast cancer and then you might need some form of surgery and then maybe radiotherapy and many other treatments that come along. You feel well. It is really, really difficult. It's unnerving to yeah, have that. Yeah. I mean, I've had just recently two of my very close friends diagnosed. And it's that whole process of, absolute shock mm. and then for women we have to get through things this yeah. is who we are yeah that's you know, how we have built. to yeah, yeah we have to take yeah. everything the home has to continue we're looking after children parents trying yeah. to work all of these things and it, it's really really hard so we have to hold it all together so there's that time when you're going through that when you're just diagnosed mm -hmm. and you're just trying to keep it together and, and I imagine there's a few different paths that women can go through of pretending it's not happening, kind of let me get on and just mm -hmm. then make yourself ill with trying to manage mm -hmm. versus totally falling apart and just feeling. I mean, how do you avoid both of those? It's the difficult thing is we're all individuals, yeah. so we're all going to react in different ways. And I mean, most of the calls that we take on the helpline it's the bit before you're diagnosed that can be really, really hard because you don't know what's going on. So you when maybe you've had wrong. a biopsy taken or yeah. somebody said, I've seen something yeah. suspicious, I want to look further, that, yeah. that is actually, I've had that. Um, right. I'm sure many, many women mm. who maybe are ultimately then were not diagnosed have had experienced that and can identify mm. with that feeling. Yeah, yeah. So that time is a really difficult time when you're in no man's land, you've got no control. Then you're diagnosed, then you can start to process some of it. But yeah. you're still, it's still really, really shocking. And then it's working through results after your surgery, then your treatment and all the treatment that you go through. And then at the end, it's coming to terms with what life brings now. Yeah. Because and that's, that's when you start to deal with a lot of things around grief. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the anger, the you know, what's going on, how can I trust my body, what's happened to my body, who am I looking at when I look in the mirror? Yeah. Who is this person? Yeah. So what advice do you give to women and where should we start? So um, there's something I'm going to bring up, which I know I have done when I've suddenly been told by the doctor there's something weird going on. Is I go onto Google yeah. and I, do, I go down a rabbit hole. Mm. And I just want to talk about that because I think that is something that, you know, maybe in the diagnosis you didn't ask all the questions you wanted to ask. Mm. And then you go down mm. and you go on this sort of mad, mm. you know, trying to search mm. the truth out mm. and trying to look at all the aspects. Mm. What do you suggest somebody can do in that situation? I mean, I don't know if you feel mm. that is a situation oh, where I gosh. feel like that happens. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. I mean, uh, it, the most important thing is that you talk to somebody who knows their stuff. So your breast care nurse, your treatment team, Breast Cancer Now helpline. Mm. Because you're right, when you go for your appointment, you probably hear about 10%, 20% of what you're told, yeah. and the rest of it you will completely forget. Yeah. So being able to um, hopefully write it down when you're at the appointment, make some note of it, and then to be able to unpick it 
decipher it mm -hmm. with somebody who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. And that's a lot of what we do at Breast Cancer yeah. Now. You know, you're speaking to a nurse specialist yeah. who can then pull it apart and take you to the reputable okay. sites. I mean, I would even say, because most people have a smartphone, mm -hmm. because sometimes writing, you're not listening and you're aware of that. So whenever I'm in a situation where I really need to remember what mm -hmm. was in the room, this is not a, um, in that situation, yeah. but anything where it's, mm -hmm. I just put my phone on record. Yes, absolutely. You know, just so that then yeah. also, that we do only remember a small percentage, mm -hmm. but then when we're back with the loved one and we're thinking mm. X, Y, and Z, we can listen together and actually mm. listen to what mm. they really said. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Or ask your team to write it down. Yeah. I mean, they quite often send a letter out as well, but sometimes that's a bit protracted. So. Do you think help and support? I mean, breast cancer now started for many reasons, but mm. one of them maybe was that in the in the um, busyness of the national health system, there wasn't the support for women going through mm -hmm. breast cancer. Yeah. And do you think there are still many women you come across where they're just not getting the support, they're just getting the diagnosis? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like quite a high percentage? Or? Um, I would suggest that, I mean, because again, as women, we, we kind of, we don't ask, we don't, we just get on. Yeah. And that is really, we, we're our own enemy. Lindsay, six years on, it never goes away. It's part of my daily life now, and it's taken all my resilience and confidence, even though I've been cancer-free since my yeah. surgery. I mean, that's a very tough one, and that's, there's going to be many women yeah. on this um, live today who feel that. Yeah. What, what help and support can we give, yeah. Rachel? I mean, I, mean I, yeah. I think just, I mean, you've just completely, I don't know, I can't... Yes, it's Lindsay, Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah, do speak to the ladies. Absolutely yeah. put that out there straight because when you finish your treatment your whole family friends everybody want you to be back yeah. as you were yeah. before but you are for most people not life has changed the way I mean I talked about the way you look the way you feel you're you're worried about breast cancer coming back but everybody else has forgotten mm -hmm. and you're trying to live your life so yeah. a lot of the work starts at the end of treatment a lot of the work that women yeah. have to do yeah. to to regain. I mean, we talk about body image. We talk mm -hmm. about um, how we view our bodies. We talk about weight gain. Yeah. We talk about you know we've talked about makeup. Yeah, and, and I mean you made a very good point, and this is something that's interesting. And I find this with lots of women that I've dealt with over mm -hmm. the years doing makeovers who have maybe been through some very serious stuff. It could be a term, a, you know, a very bad illness. Um, it could be a mixture of things. It could be a, an appalling divorce. All right, yeah. but. But there's the words of, now you've got to go back to who you were. And that's the thing, it's like, first of all, I think you can never go back to who you were. And if you try to strive to go back to who you were, you've learned so much about yourself through that process. Yes. You've yeah. had to, you know, look at life fundamentally mm -hmm. very differently. Mm -hmm. And it's how can one see that as an opportunity? Because, you know, seeing your words, Lindy, it's really heartfelt. And mm -hmm. it's how can you then think, this is a chance for me to, to come out of my shell, to be a woman that maybe I've always been scared of being. We talk a lot on the Trini Tribe about be the woman you want to be today. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that chronic illness, you know, very intense illness gives you is the opportunity to think, how would I like to do it differently? Mm -hmm. um, and it could be on the most simplistic way from my perspective of women I've worked with, you know, you might all, always have dressed classically and worn dark colours. It's how can you really embrace colour and be present? Because I think when things that you relied on are stripped back, when your hair that was luscious and long is now growing back at crazy angles and curly when it was straight and mm -hmm. even a different colour, when you've been on a lot of steroids and you've got, you know, you've put, had a, a weight gain and all the clothes that gave you confidence mm -hmm. don't give you confidence anymore. These are things mm -hmm. that... You know, it's like those, I mean, simple, I would say at the stage is take everything out of your cupboard that doesn't fit you. Don't be faced with what makes mm. you feel less than anywhere in your life. So take them out, put them under the bed, you know, put them away and just think, even if you bought like three outfits that represented who you wanted to be and on days you felt the lowest, you wear those outfits, you wear, you know, if one day is about, today I'm going to be a crayon and I'm gonna wear color head to toe, like I'm doing it today just for breast cancer now, but you know, I'm gonna wear color head to toe and I'm going to do something where people see me, that's the other thing, because you need to do this in 
front of as witness to people witness to what you're trying to do for yourself i think that's a key part of then moving forward so that's one thing i would do one day another thing i'd do another day is think have i done my same makeup for years mm -hmm. you know our faces change when we go through illness and yeah. we get more lines we get more kind of you know a chemo face and i have made over many women who've been going through chemo and you feel the grayness and you feel the sort of real the life has gone out of your face. So we talked before about, you know, giving yourself a Sunday massage, stimulating your skin, getting the blood flow, doing my mad scissoring, giving yourself a lovely cleansing ritual, wearing blusher if you've worn bronzer all your life, taking away the hard eyeliner and putting something soft. These are, they're tiny sort of superficial things, but when you put them together, they can amount. So I think, look at all of that. Look at, do you wear classic boring shoes? I know this sounds really weird, but like, you know, we can wear shoes that make ourselves very classic. Put on a bloody stacked white trainer or, you know, take yourself out of your comfort zone. And I think that's something on, on that I could offer. You can offer a lot more in terms of emotive um, support. But, you know, you could just say, this week, I'm going to set myself two little challenges. And I'm saying this to Lindsay's and all the Lindsay's out there, but let's just move on to some other questions. And then also here, um, we can just talk about some of the things. So um, uh, when you are diagnosed with an advanced rare cancer, when each round of treatment is unsuccessful, it's hard to recognize the person looking back at you in the mirror as being the person you've always been. Okay, Rachel, what would you say? To Alison, do, do I mean, say I, to Alison. I think it's it is really really difficult, and it's about finding something, as you've said, Trini, that you can pull on, and it might be something really really small yeah. that you do. It might be that you find a way. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day who had lost her eyebrows, yeah, and she could not look at herself in the mirror. Yeah. So being able to get up in the morning, find your eyebrows again, yeah. put them on, yeah. That will just give you some sort of yeah. small anchor. Yeah. And it's the small wins that make the big wins. Yeah. So it's about maybe setting some very small goals. I mean, for some people, that 10 minutes walking around the block yeah. is really yeah. hard. But yeah. if you can do it and you write it down and you'll see that within a few weeks you're doing 20 minutes, you're doing 30 yeah. minutes, that will raise your endorphins. It will make you feel a lot better. better and sometimes when we're stuck in this place where everything seems just the tiniest thing you think we will it make a difference and i love hearing you say rachel each little step makes a difference mm -hmm. and it does i know that um because if and, you look at the big things if you think i want to lose weight yeah it becomes overwhelming and you end up stuck yeah you don't yeah move. and i think it's but i mean i i have many women who have been you know whether they're going through treatment or not have issues around body love you know and and body love is a tough one and i think that if you can get to a place where you can like more the body you're in yeah. it helps so much and it's that it's that acceptance it is that kind of you know there's certain things that are not going to if you're determined to lose the weight but there's certain things where you're taking you know um prescription medicine where you're going to be puffy and things like that yeah. so learn to contour a bit um you know wear clothes that they might not be fit to show so let's say you're really proud of your figure mm. then be proud of your style mm. because i've seen women of every single size there is out there be really stylish mm. and feel they have something and and wear things that people go what's that you know that's such a tiny thing but if you you know, if you're wearing the most boring thing and you just put on a fun mad necklace, I have a parrot necklace, all right, that I got from Liat Ginsberg in Israel. And whenever I'm really flat, I wear these parrots around my neck and people always go, you know, and I do it in a way because I need to connection and I can't always say, I'm feeling shit, can you talk to me please? So I need something on my body to bring people into my yeah, life. Yeah. And so things like that, I do believe are important. Um, in the US, patients are advised on the type of implants. I had no say or what implant I had in December. Should we talk? Let's talk about that and let's talk about sexuality because obviously with breast cancer, you can't always have reconstructive surgery. Mm. I mean, some people do reconstructive surgery straight away and some people don't. Yeah. How does that whole thing work and how can you have a say 
in your implant. So, I mean, if you're going to have a mastectomy operation, which is removal of the breast, then your team should talk to you about reconstruction. Yeah. And it will depend on who you are, the size you are, your body, yeah. and what type of reconstruction might be available to you. Yeah. And there will quite often be choices and you will be able to make those with your surgeon. Mm -hmm. Some people choose not to have reconstruction, reconstruction and yeah. to remain flat. Yeah. Some women will choose to have a prosthesis, yeah. which is a breast uh, yeah. that fits inside the bra. And um, for others, they will go flat for a while and then we'll come back and have reconstruction yeah. at a later date. Okay. So, so with this lady, and if you're, I, I think that, I think it's awful that she couldn't choose the type of implant. And I think, how can you own your rights in the doctor's mm. consultation? That's, again, it's about, it's about gathering information. Yeah. So right. the, but you also, have, it has to be a dialogue mm -hmm. between your team yeah. because they will know what will suit you yeah. and also it would be what's available. Okay, but um, there, there is a balance between what's available and what will suit you yeah. because, yeah. you know, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And obviously we've, we've been through a terrible two years where yeah. surgery's been really difficult. And so. also we're catching up and a lot of women went undiagnosed so yeah. we're going to have a lot more ladies out there. Um, um, I went through... Mine in the first lockdown, it was awful. I had to attend all my appointments yeah. alone. And during my treatments, we were in lockdown, so I could see, I couldn't see friends mm -hmm. and family support. It had a lasting effect on me. I think, yeah. Liz, it's like, in a way, to me, it's catch up time. And it's about giving yourself permission to, in a way, go through with your friends what you had to go through on your own so you don't feel, mm -hmm. so you can look back and feel you did have their support. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, it's, I, it's, I think it, many women Liz, have gone through it's, that. Oh, it's been terrible. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. Imagine. And how much a, has breast cancer now been able? Did you put extra people on the phones? How did you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had obviously loads and loads of yeah. calls and we're still dealing with it now. Yeah. But going to have your diagnosis and not being able to take. Anyone anybody with you, with you yeah. and to have that support yeah. has been incredibly difficult and you know we speak to people it's it's a form of PTSD that a lot of women are living with so what can they do after breast cancer well I would say to you start off by either speaking to your breast care nurse or to breast cancer now mm -hmm. we can talk this through with you I'm going to give you the number now 0808 800 6000 and we're open today, Monday to Friday, Saturday mornings. If you want to talk through what you're feeling, we often hear from women that this, what we're talking about this morning yeah. is trivial. It is not trivial. Yeah. It is so, so important for your future and for your recovery. Yeah, okay, that's great. Good to know. Don't ever feel something is too little because it's never, ever too little. Um, um, thank you for addressing this. Diagnosed a year ago, I had three months of chemo, mastectomy and reconstruction, and I'm now on another course of chemo. Sometimes the hardest thing is managing other people's expectations, but actually we need to focus on self. Lisa, yes. this is something I really want to discuss because mm -hmm. for those watching who are not going through breast cancer and for those going through breast cancer, I think sometimes I have noticed with friends of mine that they end up having to help their family and friends get through the diagnosis when they he need the help the most and how do you navigate that when you sort of it needs to be about you not in a way that it's about me but it's like it is about you bottom line and you end up caretaking other people's feelings around it how do we navigate that whether we're the friend what can we do to help or the patient Mm. I mean, for the person... Um, do speak to um, Lisa um, there. Yeah. Hello, Lisa. For the person who's diagnosed, it is... You're dealing with just so many people. Um, you're de you know, friends, family, having to tell people over and over again, having to tell the story of your diagnosis is incredibly traumatic. And then dealing with their emotions. Some people will even cross the street from you. Some people will not speak to you anymore yeah. others will be absolutely amazing and those people that are amazing are the ones that will send you a text every day and will say I'm here I'm here for you today mm -hmm. they will not say to you um, what can I do they will say to you I'm bringing round supper I will put it on your doorstep and you don't have to answer the door just pick it up and take it or 
I will come round and I will pick your kids up and I will take them to school. Okay. They're not asking, yeah. they're okay. giving. Okay, so therefore, all those people who are watching who have friends going through it, I think that's really good advice because when you have a friend going through something, you feel powerless to help them get well in terms of you're not a doctor. So then it is, what can I do to help? What can, and, I, and, and that's so right, Rachel, that nuance is you're then putting the onus back on the person who has had the diagnosis, whereas I'm here for you, or the, that kind of knowing that in the background, I think going through anything and having messages. I remember when, my, um, when Lila's father died mm. and the messages I did find the hardest were, what can I do? Or, do, you know, it was like when I had to make I had to take the time to then respond back mm. and I just didn't have the energy. Mm, mm. And it was those people who, who literally just text me every day saying, just saying hi, I'm here for you. It was just so, it sort of carried me through um, that whole um, time in my life. And those people I remember the most mm. and they're consistent. So, you know, recently a friend of mine's husband died and I just remember that. You know, and when it's happened to us, we then remember how we mm. can be with other people. And I just then send a text every day just yeah. saying, I'm here for you. And, you know, thinking of you today, mm. that kind of stuff. But yeah. it is that. I think it's, it's, I, it's a tough one, this. But I'm going to also ask you, um, Rachel, that when um, somebody you know has a, you know, stage four, mm. that it's, it's, a, it's, that it's not a great place that they're in. Mm. And the prognosis is very um, finite. Mm then what can you do as a friend? And how do you speak as a friend with them? How do you navigate it so that you don't say, I mean, we're all so scared of saying the wrong thing, mm -hmm. but then it's sometimes, as you say, it makes us, some people then cross the street because they don't yeah. know what to say and they feel frozen in their ability to help. So what can you tell people who might be watching, who might have a friend who's had a really very bad diagnosis please just let them know it's it's really about listening it's about being there it's about sitting with your friend family member and allowing them to speak so it will be painful it will be difficult but if you can allow them to say what they need to say and remember they're living they're living their lives and many women with secondary breast cancer so breast cancer that's come back and this is laura you're leaving this comment too about it's very difficult secondary breast cancer a little talk about yeah. it so do so, talk about so that rachel yeah. when breast can cancer has come back women are still going to work still looking after their kids they might be on treatment but they're they're living their lives so remembering that but no, so that they can have some normality but not forgetting that they are living this day to day as well. Yeah, I think um, Rebecca, this is a different one, but it's it's an illness. I suffered from severe drug addiction for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I always used to think I want to go back to how it was before, but I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to be better than that. I want to take all my mistakes and what I've been through and better myself. It's definitely about getting your confidence back though. I think Rebecca, it's, you know, they're both illnesses and um, they both, mean that you have to make a decision do you want to live the life of today and tomorrow or yesterday and today and i think that's you know it's like are we living in the present mm -hmm. or living in the past and it's i i i i think when johnny died after that i made a very big decision to never live in the past mm -hmm. it was just something's happened in your life where you make a decision that you're not going to live in the past and i feel that's in a way what Rebecca is saying to because she's been through recovery. Julia, chemo and weight loss has made my face really thin. Eyes are sunken. I'm using the, cup, the cold cap to try to prevent hair loss, but I can't use a brush or a hairdryer. So my hair is a frizzy mess. What can I do? I almost feel like there's no point keeping my hair if it's going to look awful for the rest of the year. This is such a tough one when you talk about that because it's that sort of desperation to hold on to the hair. The cold cap sometimes works, but then it's very, um, irregular in its in mm. its um, what falls out. So, what do you suggest to Julia? So what I would suggest to you, Julia, if you're in the UK, is to get in touch with the charity Cancer Hair Care, who we work with a lot at Breast Cancer now, and they are absolute experts on looking after hair, whether it's um, as a result of cold cap or whether it's growing back or um, whether it's about to fall out, wigs and all all of that, and looking after your scalp. So, so have a chat with them and um, I'm sure they'll be really helpful.
It's a very personal choice, isn't it, of whether you want to actually just have all your hair off mm. and just be clean. Mm. Can I just ask you, I know every woman is different, and mm. it depends also the relationship you've had with your hair. Like mm. we were saying earlier, if your hair has been your thing that made you feel your most as a woman, then I think it's the hardest to let go of. Mm. And, and friends of mine who've gone through chemo, I notice they're the ones who are you know, really religiously do the cold cap and everything. Yeah. And other women who maybe their hair was sort of not their best point, they've just thought, actually, let's just get it off. Mm. I mean, do you feel there's any... It's, 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 it's really, just very really personal, in, yeah. isn't it? It's very, really, very really personal. Really individual. But yeah. obviously, when you're looking at yourself in the mirror all the time, it's, it's back to that eyebrow thing. Yeah. What age do I get checked, Ivalo? Very good question. So if, again, if you're in the UK, it's, you're having screening mammograms from the age of 50, yeah. every three years until the age of 70, and then you can call for your own mammogram after the age of 70. Okay. Um, if you have a family history, a strong family history, then you will have um, much earlier screening. mammograms and MRI scans, and yeah. much earlier screening. I mean, also the strong family history, if, you're, if your mother was pre-menopause when she got cancer, my mother was post-menopause when she got cancer, which I think is a bit different. Oh, yes. Yeah, and if she, uh, if she got it uh, earlier, then I, yeah. So if you're worried about your family history, um, you can call us at Breast Cancer Now and we can talk it through, or you can go and, if you can get an appointment with your GP, go and see your GP yeah. and have a chat with them and see whether um, you need to go and have an assessment. Yeah, and let's just do for now, because Rachel did this with us before, how we check our breasts, Rachel, right. because there's ways you do it. And some people believe lying down and some people standing up. So give us, we're going to do it together now. All right, so... so. when you're... I mean, the way I would teach it is when you're washing it, because it, it needs to be something that doesn't become all-consuming. Yeah. So when you're washing and showering, so long as you're not using a sponge or a, anything like yeah. that, you will be checking your breasts as you're washing. Yeah. When you get out of the shower, stand in front of the mirror, put your arms on your waist and push in and the muscles will just, you can see all the contour of the breast and if anything's pulling it in, when you're looking in the mirror, just check it, check the area. If you've got an area of lumpiness on one side that you've noticed, always check with the flat, flat. this bit of your hand, not your fingers, yeah. and work your way across the breast. And then and the why other is side. that? Is that because we will feel, you feel the wrong everything. thing? You yeah. feel everything. So that's re I remember that before mm -hmm. from you, mm -hmm. and I've just been doing that now. Up into the armpits, yeah. up to the collarbones. Yeah. Um, and then when you put your moisturizer on, that's another time yeah. without thinking. Yeah. We check. Most women will come across. A change in their breast mm -hmm. whether it be a change to the contour of the breast the nipple nipple discharge um, a lump it's not always a lump yeah um, they will find it women are very intuitive they are okay so remember that and if you feel people don't know how to do it um, please let them know Elena it's self-care to be your authentic self the novel is self empowering love it um, great empathy ladies in this conversation we helped many good I handled the whole process very well I wished Doctors, consultants in, and surgeons denied me double mastectomy as cancer was only on one breast. I'm now lopsided, worse than losing two. I'm annoyed but not angry because I consider myself lucky and living my best life. Mm, yeah. yeah, that's a very good attitude, Corinne, because that must have been tough when, you, when that happened. Wendy, I was diagnosed with breast cancer on Monday. One of my biggest worries is looking ill during chemotherapy in front of my children who are just seven and 10. Let's help Wendy. Yeah. I mean, Wendy, what I'd say to you is, if you feel that you can give us a call, we can really talk this through with you. Um, it's, I mean, because you're, you're probably thinking about your hair and it's, when you've got young children, you have to be honest with them. So prepare them. There are lots of great books out there. And again, we can help you with that if you want to give us a call or look on our website um, to prepare them for what you're going to, the changes that are going to happen for you, potentially with hair loss, eyebrows, eyelashes, those kinds of things, and your energy levels. And some days you will just not have energy. Um, so being able to say to them, this is what's happening for yeah. me. This is how long it's going to be like this. Please, you know, ask me anything. Yeah. At any time, you can ask me a question. If you're scared or worried, because yeah. children, young children yeah. particularly, they mm -hmm. will ask the most, they will say, when you're going to die, mommy. Yeah. They will say the, yeah. the starkest things. Yeah. Um, but it's important that they're allowed to speak. And that in honesty, having yeah. seen families where it's been hidden mm -hmm. versus families where it hasn't, hasn't, I would say, 
Don't hide it. No. Uh, will you repeat the number, Rachel, so Wendy can write oh, it down 0808 now? 800 6000. I reorganised my wardrobe. Not only was it fun, but it encouraged me to lose weight that I had a goal to aim for. It's helped me get on track after cancer. Karen, it's the simplest things. I mean, it is, you know, whenever I'm really stressed and I'm really worrying, and I've got a few things to worry about at the moment, the calmness of just rearranging what you put on your body every single day and plays a significant part in how you have your daily life is a really important thing to go through. And it's cathartic and it allows you to kind of remember what you love in your wardrobe and things that you're kind of nah, just get them out of your life. I mean, I think what cancer does is it gets the meh out of our life. We, we start to see what's important and that can be from trivial to super, super, yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. And it could and that and those simple things give you control because you lose so much control yeah, that's so true. when you're yeah. diagnosed with yeah. cancer. Yeah, doing and things that you are yeah. in control. That's so true, Rachel. Right? Mm. Yeah. Gail, I've had breast cancer twice. I had a mastectomy and my attitude still is get up, get dressed, make an effort, it all makes a difference. That's really inspiring to hear, Gail. Um, um Depends if you need more treatment after a mastectomy. Laura, I do have to say, during lockdown, finding Trini made me feel like I could make it. That's so sweet, darling. Yeah. Um, Amanda, many doctors assume you want reconstruction, but never openly offer for you to remove a healthy breast for symmetry. They assume you want reconstruction. What do you feel um, about that, Amanda? There are many, many points to that. Some women will, will want to have both breasts removed. It is not generally um, suggested that that happens. If you've got a healthy breast, yeah. the, your treatment team will not suggest to remove it. Yeah. What do, um, you, what do you feel from your experience with talking to women um, that you would feel? I mean, it's quite interesting. I was mm. talking to someone um, a few weeks ago and she had had a mastectomy and then had her healthy breast removed. And for her, as an individual, she had found it very traumatic because she had lost her breast and she hadn't thought about the sex and intimacy side yeah. of that loss yeah. of her other breast and that and the sexual part. So what you're saying part. is that having one healthy breast allowed her to have yeah. a sexual relationship where she could have, you know, things that stimulate yeah, her sexually yeah, yeah. through her breast yeah. and I think that's yeah but she had yeah that's so I she, mean that's a no, really tough thing to navigate and, but, that's, but I and it's so very see individual that. Yeah. Mm. so and you can't imagine what it's going to be like none of us can yeah. to lose a breast yeah and then to make the decision to to lose the other breast and you and just I mean having done this job for 25 years I just n never even thought about that yeah that is something I would never mm. have considered because to me, it's about symmetry. Mm. And it depends also how sexually, you know, some of us have a, a, a really healthy sex drive and some mm. of us have a more subdued mm. sex drive. So I think getting, I mean, I want to go on for a second about sex yeah. post-treatment because that for many women is really traumatic. Mm. So what is helpful to think about when you feel that you're not the woman you used to be, you're coming to terms with the woman you are if you've had reconstructive mm. surgery or you haven't. Mm. What are the things that you can say to women, maybe also it might be women who are just on the beginning of their journey, Rachel, like the lady diagnosed this week, mm. to just get them to feel more comfortable mm. around that? I mean, there are so many parts to this because it's, it's not just the physical, it's the mental. That, that happens. So your your body is physically changing and changes because of the surgery and the treatment you have, but the way your body responds. So much of the treatment that you will have will um, put you into a menopause. So your, I mean, one of the big things that women talk about is loss of libido. Yeah. So their sex drive is just, I mean, that's beside all the other things that happen. Can you go on testosterone post chemo? You can't. No. You can't go on any hormone treatment. No. Unless you have spoken to your team and you have exhausted every other avenue and you know, you've had a good old chat with them and make sure it's safe in your individual yeah, case. Yeah, because there's one or two cases where if it's a non-something breast cancer, sometimes you can, you can. there's some yeah, very sometimes few. You can. And there are, there are vaginal estrogens that you can use. 
um, in some cases, but again, that's about t talking to your team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and again, if you want help on this, please call Breast Cancer now. We're leaving the number. Um, I think the steroids is an important one here. And the, the, the thing I didn't know at the time was the large amount of steroids I was taking that have had a long-term effect on my bones. Mm, they can affect the bones. And are there any... I mean, there's so many... I mean, uh, this, in terms of the treatments for breast cancer, many of the hormone therapies that we use affect the bones mm, as well. Yeah. So it's about making sure that you're having all your checks that you need to have for your bone density. At the same your strength, time. Bone yeah. strength, okay. yeah. Okay, this is a really good one, Barbara, and I, I, I know what I'm going to say to you here. One thing I learned is to accept help from people when friends offer to help you take it. Mm. And some friends are better at certain things than others. Mm. One friend can help with shopping, some can come to the doctor and take notes with you. Mm. Let your friends help you. This is something where mm. um, I'm really bad at accepting help, mm. but I love giving help mm. because it makes me feel mm. good. So when I have somebody wanting to give me help, mm. I have to remember how it makes me feel when I give help, yes. you know? And sometimes you just have to remember that yeah. if you're somebody who finds it difficult to accept help because mm -hmm. it will allow you to accept the help. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really good point, Barbara, of, you know, some friends are good for practical things and some things are good for emotional chat. Mm -hmm. And it's not putting square pegs in round holes because mm -hmm. some people might often do something that you know they're not good at and you, you just think, oh no, I, I, I can't accept it. So it could be, you could say, look, somebody's doing that for me, but could you do this for me because you're so emotionally supportive, you know, and just tell them. It, that's even the next point that's harder is tell them what would really help you. That's, it's so difficult sometimes when one's going through something like this to have the self-worth mm. to ask for it. Mm. And, and it's, you just gotta try. Because otherwise you're managing so many people, it gets really complicated. And if you're not very draining, forward. yeah. Mm. Um, Claire, I'm a, uh, breast cancer nurse in Australia, and this is a very interesting he hearing how the UK look after patients with breast cancer. Fabulous job, Claire. I'm, it makes me sad then to think that it's harder in Australia to get good care. I, I mean, think. You, uh, Claire, I know that you do have excellent care and, and excellent charities over, over there in Australia. Um, so, uh, yeah, keep doing the good work. Yeah. Pam, my sister was diagnosed last September. I'm seeing her for the first time on Sunday. So, it is that thing of being supportive and... I'm sure you've been supported. What age do I start getting checked again? We said that, and, and in England, if you have no history of <coughs> breast cancer, it's 50. Different countries have different yeah. rules. I actually went into, I, I actually started checking myself in my 40s, I have to say, late 40s, but I went into menopause as well at 45, 46, so, so maybe that's why. Um, and my mother, but she had had it at 60. Um, Pam, seeing my sister on Sunday for the first time, this is so helpful, thank you, that's great. Um, another Amanda, it's actually about doing things rather than just saying, if I can help, if you know them, yes. you can make suggestions to help and do them. I think yes. that's such a good point because for the person to have to think, what shall I, you know, what, yeah, that, that's true. It's like, do you want me to help you with this or with this or with this? Tell me what you like to help me with. Yeah, it's much easier than for somebody to make a decision. Heather, I have a friend that's on his second round of chemo. I sent him a good morning every morning so he knows somebody is thinking of yeah. him. That's, and he'll never forget that. Yeah, that will be so yeah. important. Yeah. Karen, I was stage four. I had a terrible diagnosis, but I'm still here, and it's amazing what can be done. Mm. That's inspiring, yeah. Karen. I love you. Laura, that's what I feel like. People just won't let me speak. If I say how I feel, my fear, my thoughts, people often change the subject or tell me I have to stay positive. Yeah. 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 Oh, this is a tough one because that's what people do yeah. because they think they're being helpful doing that. Well, no, so, well, they can't also deal with what they're being told. Yeah, that's so how like can it. we help Laura with this one? I mean, sometimes, Laura, if you can't find that person in your life that you know, or people in your life that you know you can trust and speak your, speak speak your, your, truth. In, yeah, yeah. your innermost thoughts, then it's about getting yourself some support, some one-to-one -one counselling support. Yeah. Because it can be, if you invest in it now, it will pay dividends long term. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a very, it's very individual how people want the conversation to go, but I think... One thing I would try to avoid doing is saying stay positive oh, because gosh, it, it's, it's the most banal thing mm -hmm. to say and it's not 
I can't think any good that somebody will get from those words. No. And I think you're right. We say it if, we, if it's said because we don't know what to say. Yeah. So if you are the kind of person who says that because you don't know what else to say, Rachel, can you give them some new vocabulary? I mean, can you just... if, you could, if you can just sit with somebody and say, how are you today? How are you feeling? No, this must be really difficult for you because it is. And this, probably one of the most important things to say is it doesn't stop at the end of treatment. This is not the champagne day. It is the good friend is the person who will keep asking months yeah. and years down the line and remembering that this is maybe your mammogram after a year since yeah. diagnosis yeah. or um, that your treatment is finishing. You know, those kinds of people who remember those yeah. important days for you yeah. and keep remembering. Yeah, that's so true. On, on every level, that's really, really true. Um, Andrea, my sister has just been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer and secondary bone cancer. Third time she has been diagnosed with a cancer. When we talk, I always say it's your agenda. You tell me what you want or don't want. Some days you have ca we have cancer free days. Yeah. That's, that that's so perfect. brilliant, Andrea, yeah. that's really nice. And do leave your comments as well if you feel that you have learnt the language that really helps somebody going through a diagnosis or you're somebody who's gone through diagnosis and you know what language mm. really helps, please leave it on these comments. Lisa, I cold cap too, but cut my hair short before I started, which made it so much more manageable. It's a very good point, because then you're not getting mullet or weird you know, that kind of dis disjointed hair. I think that's a very good idea. Carly, my friend in Hong Kong was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, much more difficult to support when you are in different countries. I'm in Australia and not able to support in person. But um, still those messages will be important. Yeah, and an email they wake up to. You yeah. know, I think when we wake up in bed, we can have our darkest thoughts. Mm. And I think if you are in different time zones, sometimes I wake up with an email from my brother because he's in Australia and I'm lying in bed and I, it's a time before my day is busy that I absorb those, um, those emails. So always think that there can be a benefit to not being so, so on the same time zone that you're both in the busiest part of each other's day. Um, Crystal, I was never offered the possibility of a cold cap. I shaved off my hair myself on my own in the bathroom. I cried all the way through. Crystal lives in the Netherlands. Right. Yeah, and okay. I think that's... Um, everywhere, obviously, Crystal has a different um, treatment, but that must, so yeah, must have been really, really hard. Um, really hard. Um, Sally, make sure you find out if you have dense tissue, as 40% of women have that. Mammograms are not so good if you have dense tissue. I had an all clear for my mammogram, but I had a tumour which it didn't pick up. My cancer was diagnosed on a trial. What do you say to this, Rachel? I mean, I, I think if you know that you've got dense breast tissue, you're, um, you will probably have been backwards and forwards to a breast clinic, I mean, certainly in the UK, and um, hopefully you will be un under some form of surveillance. So it's good to hear that you, were in a, you ended up in a trial and, and um, had that, that diagnosed at some point because it can be really difficult to see. So how would a woman, because now there's lots of women probably watching this thinking, do I have dense breast tissue? How do you know if you might. The, the breasts tend to feel really, really heavy. Okay. Is it so generally in women with a slightly bigger breast or uh, not? No, it doesn't necessarily. It can be in 32B. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and what I was saying about, you probably will have found that you've noticed lumpiness. All right. So you might have been going backwards and forwards to your yeah. GP and to the breast clinic. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. Um, Sorry to interrupt. I've yeah. just seen a really good question from Vera. Yeah. Um, she said, what can you say to people who innocently say inappropriate things? Um, okay, what do you say to them? I suppose it depends who it is. Yeah. Um, it might be that um, you, you say that, you say that, this, you know, this is really inappropriate to hear that you're saying that and maybe we can speak another time. Um, or you say to them, it would be much nicer if you spoke to me in X, Y, and Z way. Um, or this is the way you're speaking to me now is causing me a lot of distress. Yeah. I think it's being able to voice 
your discomfort or hurt. Mm. And that's a hard thing, yeah, but it needs to be done. Jessica, I don't know the age Jessica, Rachel. If you have had it twice in your family, two sisters had similar breast cancer, should I go to get a generic genetic check? Yeah. Again, if you're in the UK, um, go either give us a call at Breast Cancer Now, the number's been pinned up, or um, go and see your GP and yeah. um, have a chat with them so they can do a proper assessment. Yeah. Tony, this is a really poignant message, for, especially for the lady earlier who has a seven or ten year old um, child. Please make sure you're honest with your children. My mum and my family chose to hide it from me. And when she died, I was a 16 year old girl and I was lost. It's affected my life choices ever since. That's really brave of you to put that on, Tony, and that really resonates with people who are wondering what to do. Um, Cyril, I wish you could do a video on clothing and underwear for post. Op, so many problems with gaping necklines and bras that swivel to the side of the remaining yeah. breast. Are there really good special breast cancer um, bras yeah, that you recommend? There are, but you, you need to, one size doesn't fit all, okay. as we know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you need to have a really good fitting of your prosthesis, find a prosthesis that is comfortable for you, and that should be provided if you're part of the NHS or yeah. in the private sector. And there are lots of really good bras out there. If you're struggling finding either of those things, mm -hmm. give us a call at Breast Cancer Now. We can talk it through. Great, thank you. All right, I'm going to do two more questions, Faith, and you, you, you take them, darling. Okay, I have seen one here. Um, that's, I, mean, I can't imagine how overwhelming this must feel, but how can I deal with the knowledge that the cancer could return? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that in itself is something that pretty much everybody struggles with. Um, it is something that can and does improve over time. You become more confident in your body again. Please do call us, talk to us. We can give you some strategies that, that might well help. Because for most people, breast cancer won't come back. It will, you know, you've had your diagnosis, you will go on to live your normal life span. Okay. And right. that's really, really important to remember. Yeah. But the fear doesn't go, it, yeah. it, it dissipates, yeah. but it, it doesn't but it go doesn't completely. Go. I can't thank you enough, Rachel, for coming to talk to us. Um, Rachel, nurse specialist with Breast Cancer Now, and we will leave the number at the end. And any comments you feel would be helpful for other people who watch this later of experiences you've gone through that you feel might benefit the community please leave the messages at the end in the comments and thank you so much for watching sending you all our love and rachel thank you so thank much you.